So, as Mike said, most of you guys know me as the guy that won a bunch of tournaments, right? I was ranked number one for years. I've been ranked top three in the world for 14 years. It's been a long run. But actually, my main skill is teaching. I have a master's degree in sports education awarded by the state based on my teaching credentials. The University of Oregon awarded it to me. And I'm the considered the pioneer of this sports education. I'm the only person to ever receive a degree in that in that uh, discipline. Before, I, when I came around, I wanted to learn how to play, and all people did was tell me what they did for success, or you know, throw it like this, or cross your chest, or lead with your elbow, drop your left arm. All these different things people said to me. Grip it tighter with your fingers. Put your finger on the rim. All these things that they passed along throughout the years, but I didn't. No one could ever tell me why. I'm a why kid. I'm that teach. The teacher hated me, okay? Because I was why, 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 why. But nobody could give me a why. So I went to college and I tried to figure out the whys. Because people tried to tell me when I first started playing disc golf that there was no correct way to do it. That it was the kind of sport where you just did what you wanted and success was uh, measured by your score and you could get there any way you wanted to. And I just couldn't believe that because I played college soccer, I played organized sports my whole life and I always went to camps and did all these different you know, things that were all biomechanical. So I looked at disc golf and I looked at it and we tested it, we put suction cups on the whole nine yards and we come to the realization that it is a biomechanical sport, there is a correct way to do it. Now, do I do it that way? No. I'm not a perfect athlete. Look at me. I'm an average guy. But there is a perfect way to do every shot biomechanically. And that's what I want to do today is touch on that for you. And then we'll spend some time putting. But I want to talk about biomechanical throwing because people don't get that anywhere. And you can't download it anywhere. There's no book on it yet. There is a book coming out that you guys should look for by a Swedish man named Christian Sandstrom. He was the world record holder at 820 feet for years. He's sponsored by Nike Europe. They have, they have paid him. He has written a book that comes out in this fall. It'll be uh, Swedish on one side, English the other direction. And it's all about what I'm teaching today. So it's something to pick up. And it's something you always can show people when they, hey, how do I play disc golf? Here you go. All right. So let's start with that. And you know, this first part won't be anything to do with putting. It's just going to be about biomechanics and trying to understand why it is we do what we do and why people told you what they told you, all right? So, what's the first thing that people told you when you started playing disco? Keep it level. There you go. Throw it across your chest, all right? Well, they didn't know why they were saying that. They just knew that, well, when I throw it really close to my chest, I throw it really straight. Well, that's all the reason they told you that. But they were right. The truth of it is, is that if you're throwing and you want to throw the disc perfectly straight, you want to reach back perfectly straight and pull it right across your chest perfectly straight. All right? See how the disc never leaves the line it's on? It's always on the exact same line, this straight line here. But how often, even at high stand, do you throw a disc perfectly straight? Once? Maybe? You know? And so that's the problem is that most players when they got to that point and said, okay, I reach back, they told me to reach back, and then when they get to the impact zone, they said, for a hyzer, I better drop my shoulder. For an anhyzer, I better lift my shoulder. And that's basically what you came up with because the disc that they sold you, if you didn't do that, they just all went left, okay? But if you watch top pros, how often do you see Ken Climo shank it off the cliff? I've never even seen it. Play with him since I was this big. And the answer is that he misses short or long. He doesn't, or maybe a little bit left and right, five, ten percent. But never like, is he throwing it here and goes and throws it over there? Never happens. And the reason for that is that he's not doing what you, what I was talking about, dropping or lifting the shoulder. And, and what that causes is for you to pull the disc off the line that you're throwing. So if you're throwing it there and your line's here and you're pulling it across, if you drop your shoulder, see how you make a curvature with the disc? If you're throwing there and you lift your shoulder, you see I take it off the line? And the only chance you have of throwing a good shot is the days that as you let go, you let go right on the line as you go by. Or you let go right on the line as you go by on the hyzer. That happens and that's the day you shoot 10 down and you're pumped. And you come out the next day with the same disc and you shoot over par. And you're like, this triple X is no good. <laughs> But it isn't the triple X. It's the fact that that day you happen to be letting go one foot past the line. Because it's really tough to let go in a space that big, an imaginary space. 
So what professional players do is they make a mirror of their backswing. If you can concentrate on the back of your swing and not the front of your swing, then you'll play disc golf much better. Most people are concentrating on the front of their swing out here. But if you watch most pros, by the time we're here, it's gone. The disc is already gone. And what, why, how we do that is, say I'm trying to throw a hyzer over this gentleman's head, okay? Instead of reaching straight and dropping in over his head, what we do is we make a line with his, with his line right over his head, and we reach back to match that. So if I'm here and I'm throwing there, I don't reach straight back, I reach to the outside. Because that puts my shoulder right here in a perfect line over his head, and then I can still throw straight. Because all I ever want to do is throw straight. Because a continuous line is always better than a broken line in any mathematical formula. So if I can just put the disc on the hyzer pole and pull it perfectly straight, then I won't lose any momentum. Thus, if I throw an anhyzer over your head, instead of reaching straight back, I want to reach inside my body here. So that I can pull a perfectly straight line to you. Does that make sense? Now two things happen with that is what height to throw it at and how do I know I have the right angle? Well, in both those cases, this is where some of the biomechanics kicks in. When you're throwing the hyzer and you reach back outside your body, watch, you reach outside your body, if you're here, you're going against the joint. See all that? Against that, against the shoulder. If you pull it naturally, you pull it in, the shoulder does its usual thing, your elbow bends and you throw correctly. That's how you know you're throwing a hyzer. Vice versa, if you reach inside, but your hyzer, you're again pulling against the, against the joints. But if you pull it straight with the disc lower, pulling with the elbow. Does that make sense? Now, you heard all that, that's a lot. I'm trying to talk really fast, we don't have much time. So then, how do I know what height to throw it? If, based on the information I just gave you. Anybody follow me? I want to throw it right above this branch, right here. How do I know where to reach from? All of the line. So make a mirror of the release. So the release I need is here, all the way up there, right? On a little bit of hyzer, so I need to reach it away from my body and this much below the waist. That makes a perfect mirror for me to throw it right over that branch. Thus, if I was throwing downhill and I wanted to throw it right there, I'll throw it right there. Okay? Reverse of that angle would be here, up here. See how it's just above to just below? You have to make a mirror of your backswing. And how you get better at disc golf is concentrating on just that. Practicing looking at your hand and then throwing. Look. Throw. Pay attention to where the disc is back here. Once it's up here, I never see it. We can't tell. That's the trust part. Okay? Now, I like to show people all the time who's got three discs. We're not going to lose yeah. them. Here. Perfect. Three, pretty much the same, right? Yep. Watch. So that's where I'm throwing. I don't want to lose this disc or anything. I'm not going to throw them very far. I don't care what happens after they leave my hand because I don't know what kind of stability they are. But watch the angles they leave my hand and the lines. So the first thing to being good at throwing disc is to not look. Anybody here play baseball, hockey? golf, tennis, at any point when you're making that swing, do you go like this and look at the crowd? Do you hit the ball like this? No, but 99.9% .9 of disc golfers throw like this. Right? They turn their head, they pull the disc off the line, that thing we were just talking about, that pulls the shoulder and the neck up, and now you're looking and throwing because you want to see where it goes. But if you do that, then you've lost the whole contact point, which is slapping the slap shot or the racket or the bat. That's the biomechanical part. Just imagine when you're doing it, if it feels weird at first, that you're trying to hit a slap shot into the net, but you're not looking at the puck. How could you do that? Nobody can do that, not even the best in the world. So that's the first thing to think about. Pull it across my chest, it's going to go straight. Simple. I don't have to look. I want to throw the disc hyzer. Okay, let me move over here so I'll hit one of you. 
The only difference is your back foot becomes the anchor to put it on the line. It's a half circle back here, so you go, Kaiser. Reach away from my body. Kaiser. Right? There's nothing to it. You can't miss the angle if you have the angle correct back here. So now I want to throw an Anheuser. My feet are straight. Oh, I want to throw an Anheuser so I can get on the Anheuser line. I reach back, Anheuser. I'm going to throw it perfectly straight, but it's going to throw an Anheuser. Watch. Right? There isn't anything to it. Okay? It has to do with the back of the swing. If you concentrate on that, you will get so much better at playing disc golf. Now, the question is, how do you practice that? How do you get good at something that if you did that on the course, you lose all your frisbees here in Wisconsin? Now, some drills you can work on to make this happen that I find are the easiest are two things. Buy yourself an equalizer. That's that rubber thing. You can buy them at any sporting goods stores. They come in three different weights. They cost $10. They're a rubber string. You attach it to something and you stretch. Take one of your drivers that you like to lift, cut a hole in the middle, tie it around your disc, okay? Attach it to door handle, not chest height, but door handle height. If you're shorter than me, go lower. If you're around my height, door handle, go higher. If you're above my height, I'm about 5'11", okay? Why is it door handle height before we go any further? Sorry, I'm putting a lot of information out there, but we only got an hour. Why is it door handle height? Anybody got any questions, answers for that? Belt. Out of your core, belt line. Out of your core, that's correct. For some reason, disc golfers told people to do this. There's no power up here. Just imagine that there was a family on the tracks and you were one armed guy and you ran over there and you had to pull them off the tracks. Would you reach across your chest? They, they, you wouldn't pull them off the tracks, the train would hit them. You'd have to get low in your core and pull it through your, your gut or they would, you wouldn't make it off the tracks. So, door handle height. Now when you're standing this far from the door, Put your hand on the door, put your other hand here. Drop the disc, go over, that's where I want you to stand, okay? You pull that disc from the door, as soon as you get it to here, it'll feel okay. As soon as you do that thing that 99.9% .9 of golfers do, you'll feel strain right here. It'll be like, literally like pulling weights. At that same distance from the wall, it'll feel like you're pulling Swiss cheese. Nothing to it because you're going with the joints and with the muscles instead of against them. And what happens is when you throw a disc like this, besides taking your head offline, your hip, your foot, everything, you're using these muscles. And if you know, if you understand biomechanics at all, these are the weaker muscles. The top side muscles are thin and they're more for stabilization. You wanna use your underside core arm muscles to throw the disc and your lat, not the top of your shoulder. Your deltoid's not built for that and after five years or so, you'll be hurt. You'll always be tired in your shoulder when you play, or you'll develop some kind of elbow injury where it defers, where you see these guys wearing these elbow wraps. That's what it's from. So if you want to stay safe, you want to learn to lead with that elbow and practice pulling off the wall. And you can still stand at the angle and do the hyzer pull. Stand at the angle, do the hand hyzer pull. Okay, does everybody follow that? Second way, once you're comfortable with it and you're ready to take it outside, find yourself a picnic table. Put a soda, anything you want on the bench of the picnic table so that it's beside you about where that brown spot is right there okay and I, I can see the little can on the table practice running up and throwing discs where you never take your eye off the can keep looking at the can and then see your disc okay so the question you're going to ask yourself when you're doing it is when do i get to look at the disc when your left shoulder rotates your head through just like when you swing a bat club or a racket. When you see them, what do they do? They swing, 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 touches, look. Oh, there's my ball. Disc golf. Swing, 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 touches. Oh, there's my disc. That is what the shoulder's for. If you're not doing that, you're throwing like this. See how there's nothing happening? But look, at when the shoulder rotates, how much more momentum I will get on the disc. Now, keep on, one little thing with that is you see a lot of people doing this. Right? I see it all over the internet. It looks cool. I ain't gonna lie. It looks really cool to go. All right? 
But if you think about it, if your arms are out wide, you can't spin as fast as when your arms are in tight. So I sat around, and I was like, people love jump button. There's got to be a legal way to do it. So I went through it all, and if you notice, the McBeths, the Wysockis, they're not jumping anymore. They don't even want to deal with it. They're learning to stand still and pump it in there, no matter how far away they are. But I like to jump, and so do a lot of people. So I know it looks goofy, but the only legal way I found to jump putt looks like this. And the reason for that is because you're right-handed, you want to read with, lead with that right leg, it wants to come off the ground. That's why the other ones let you do it. You want to come off your right leg. So when you're doing the other ones, you kind of wait and you come off that right leg or you come off that right leg. So why not put your foot behind the mark and bring that right leg up and come off it? All right, now that's completely legal. I mean, does that look legal or not? Yep. My left foot on the ground when I'm letting go? Want to see it again? And I'm gonna pre premiere this probably by about the US Open. I just started working on it a month or two ago when I was doing the clinics. Pretty sure it's actually mechanically better because I haven't taken it to a lab yet, but look, together, against, doesn't make sense. Right leg, right arm should always be in sequence. It's left arm, left leg in sports. Right arm, right leg, see how they're the same? Should be the same in putting. So if you're going opposite, that's why sometimes they touch because their body wants to do right leg. Does that make sense? So any questions about jump putting before we get into the other stuff? Dave. I see a lot like on the circles, is that wherever the circle is, then you'll usually see a jump putt, is that? Yeah, that's correct. And the rule is, even though it's an unfortunate rule, okay. is that if the back of your disc is outside the circle, it doesn't matter if the front is. As long as any part of the back of your disc is outside the circle, you can jump putt. Okay. So your disc, say that's the line and right here, and you, you know, your disc lands like that, you're actually allowed to jump putt. And you can jump putt. Even Just like that, what you're showing us or no? Yeah. 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 But I would think that if you want to get good as the next generation, learn to stand still. All right, now let's get to some regular putting. So traveling around the world, I noticed that there was different styles of putts. And I created these names that you see going around. And again, I made a mistake. I was young and dumb. I thought I knew everything. And I called it the push putt and the spin putt. Spin putt already existed, but I called the other one the push putt. And people around the world adapted that, okay? But what I was teaching was not a push button. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand mechanics yet and stuff like that. So it made sense to me to call it the push putt, what you see me do just now. But it's not a push button. So today I want to change the names and show you how to do each of them. Okay? So the first one is not the push putt. It should be called the pitch putt. Or nobody wants to call it this. I think it should be called the shovel putt. Mm -hmm. But it's not very attractive. So nobody's like, oh, shovel, that's gross. If you look at it, the difference between what people are attempting to do and what I was trying to teach is that difference. People that are doing it are holding it out here, like, okay, you said push it, and they're going like this. Okay, see that? And it has like a nose down effect. The reason that ours looks flat and isn't nose down is because we're holding it upwards, so that we come under the shovel, and it should feel like there's nothing to it. You come from underneath, okay? And that's why we do it, is it takes no effort. The style is to be easy. It should be like throwing a feather. You hold it nose up and you come from underneath. It's almost hard for me to be sure. See that? It floats. You're allowing the disc to fly. And how does it rotate? Is that it's round, and instead of holding it out like I showed you the first time, like most people are doing, like this, we turn our thumb to nine o'clock. So that when we do it, our thumb goes from nine to noon, and that causes the slight rotation you see in the air. Look. And see how my hand stays flat? I don't go past, I just, when your hand's at nine and you open it, look, it causes rotation. See that? It's about a half rotation. So that's what a push putt is. Pitch butt. Pitch butt, sorry. See? 15 years of teaching the wrong thing, I still can't get it. Right. So a push putt should be what Paul Macbeth does. You watch Paul Macbeth, 
You guys probably never heard of Mike Mosier. Mike oh, yeah. Mosier. Delaware do so? Yep. Mike Mosier. Um, Jeremy Coling, kind of. What they're all doing is they're bringing the disc into their core, and then they're actually pushing it. They're not doing that crazy spin putt that I used to think they were doing, where I said push versus spin in all those clinics. They're actually, let me stay over here so you guys can see me. They're actually just holding the disc on that perfectly straight line, bringing it into their core. Like Beth kind of goes like this, right? I can't do it, but. And they bring it into their core and they just push it. They're just pushing it forward. They're just, okay? It's not, it's spinning just like with the push pup because of that half wrist rotation. And if you look at the Macbeths and these guys, why they're so consistent, it's because it never leaves the line. They don't have any, any dropout. There's no way to miss, just high and low. They bring it into the core, push it forward, okay? That's what a push putt should be. And I'm gonna change that. I'm doing city to city across the US. So I'm gonna change that. That's what a push putt's gonna be known for in about two years. It's gonna be about two years to change it. In two years, people will be doing this, call it the push. Okay? That is the new style, in my opinion. That's gonna be where the players of tomorrow are doing it because it's better in the wind. Okay? The push putt is great for inside the circle, no wind, it's more consistent. Pitch putt, so more consistent. Now what makes a spin putt is when you take it off the line. Because that allows you to get more rotation on it and zap it. And boy, you can get good with the spin putt, but you can't get consistent. And the difference is instead of bringing it into the core, they usually bring it to here, left hip, or right hip. So the left hippers look like this. They bring it down like Eric McCabe, pop it in there, all right? And it's a cool looking putt in the air and when you're on fire, you're on fire. When you get the yes for lung marks, they bring it down to this hip, they cock it in here, spin, all right, wind drop that. But you see how that, that action works? In both those situations, the disc leaves the line. That's why it's a spin putt, because it's now having to rotate back onto the line. The push putt is consistent because it never leaves the line. And the pitch putt is consistent because it never leaves the line, and you're lobbing it with that nose up effect, so it doesn't take much to get it there. With their push putt, like Macbeth, they have to give it a little pop. With the pitch putt, like Climo, you just literally, whoop. And if, if, when you're doing it right, it feels like you're barely doing it. It's been so many times in my career from right here in the tournament where I line up and I'm like, oh, I mean, oh, it's there. Okay. Because I didn't give it anything, but because it was nose up, it just floated right in. And I was like, thank you. And that's why I switched to it because there was a point in my career where I did like Eric McKay, that spin putt that you just saw. And I'd be playing against the great Ken Climo. I mean, and he was good. People think my bet is good, but I don't have that extra gear. When he went up by 10, then he went up by 20. When he was up by 20, he'd go up by 26. He, you know, you'd be like, oh, he's winning by 20. Okay, I got a shot. And he'd still break the course record the next two rounds. The guy was phenomenal, right? And what I would do is I'd get to the situation where if I could just make these putts, I could hang it, almost beat it. And I couldn't do it with that spin putt. I'd walk up in the pressure situation, and I'd get that spin putt over here, and I'd go, no, oh, now I can't do it. But I, that's just I'm not doing it. But I throw it right into the rim, over and over and over again, or high, or chain out, or spin out. And one day, I was sitting there about to quit. I was sitting on a bench. He just beat me for I don't know how many times in a row, 17. And I had to beat him the whole weekend. And I was looking sad, and he's like, why don't you just learn how to do it? He's like, it's real simple. He's like, you never miss from here with the push button. Like this. He's like, there's nothing to it. You just lift your arm up, dude. You know? And once I developed it, it made me want to stay with the game. So if you're not going to learn how to do one of the first two putts, pitch or push, then you're probably never going to make it in the tournament. Like I know Eric McCabe won a world title, but look at his consistency. I love the guy, but look at his consistency. Just look at the stats. So you have to learn one of those two putts and practice it. So, I'll end this with the five things that great putters do, all right? So you should take it home and practice, all right? First thing that great putters do is they don't move their head when they putt, okay? 
People that miss tend to tilt their chin up and down, missing high and low when they let go of the disc, not realizing. So the first practice routine is to put a putter on your head, get in your putting stance, and learn how to putt without moving the putter. You think it looks easy, but give it a try. Okay. Another two thing that great putters do was that drill that I showed you with the uh, bending over or picking up the disc. They learn bounce. You have to develop your own routine. Look at ball golf right now, they're playing the championships. Watch it tonight. Every one of those putters has some kind of little waggle, or lose his head, or lifts his right shoulder. Everybody's different, and we all feel different. So you have to develop your own. Okay, so right now, I want you to, to commit to one in your mind, and when I'm in the zone, that when I drop, I'm not ready to go. But I commit to it. I just go with it, all right? And I think that's the key to being good. That hesitation is called performance anxiety. Okay? And that's caused by your doubt in your head and all the different factors. Everybody has to affect people differently. And if you want to get over performance anxiety, you have to learn how to let go of it even when you don't want to. Alright? So for me, it's one, two, as soon as I drop, I lift. Right? No matter what, that's what I do throughout the whole 18 hole. They say, look at a chain. Pick a spot. Well, that's pretty difficult. What they should say is look it in. See it in. Because that's what you do when you pitch. Let's go back to baseball. That pitcher never loses frame of that glove until the ball hits the glove. He's the only person in the game who sees it. Most of us can't even see it. But the pitcher is focused, look at his eye line, to when it hits the catcher's glove. So he can hit the glove over and over again. Because it's pretty difficult to hit a glove at 90 feet. Try it sometime, it's not easy. All right? And so what great putters do is figure out where is their line on the basket, and they stay looking at that until the disc comes to rest. Most people, as soon as the disc looks like it's about to go in, they look away. They look down, they look up, they look at their feet, they look at something. When I watch videos of the great players, when they miss low, they're hitting into the tray, their eye line literally goes down. Or when they go off the top, as they're putting, their eye line goes up a little bit. If they had stayed focused in the target, they would have a much better chance of making it. Now to go with that is to understand that if you're right-handed, you're, that you're more than likely right eye dominant, okay? And right eye dominant people, what they think is center is actually to the right. And how you measure that is you go home, you put your eye up, you look at the piece of paper on the wall, you see, you close this eye, you see if it moves. All right, you can look it up on the internet. It's like a five-step process. It's called right eye, left eye dominant theory. Bowlers, darts, gun shooters, marksmen, they all use it because they want to be accurate. So for me, what I think is center is actually about three inches to the right. So I aim three inches to the left of the pole, and you can see I line up to aim three inches left of the pole. And when it comes out of my hand, it's in the center because that's my dominantness. And as I get further away, it gets a little bigger, just like when you're shooting a gun. That's why at the Marine level, when you're a sharpshooter, it doesn't really mean much. It means that you can pull the trigger. It's your spotter who measures your dominant miss and eye and tells you two clicks to the left a millimeter. And then you move the gun, shoot again. He goes, nope, one click more to the left. It's learning how far your eyes off from what you're actually shooting. Does that make sense to everybody? So I want everybody to aim more left than you usually would, but commit to the shot. Now the last thing we don't participate in, and I just want to go real quick, I bet we're out of time already, but it has nothing to do with practicing, it has to do with your, your mind. The fifth and final thing, in my opinion, that what great putters do is they practice by themselves. When you look at the best players of my generation, the generation before me and this generation, you'll find them at courses by themselves practicing putting, at a basket by themselves. And the reason for that is, is that when you play games with your friends, you, you, you have a hard time breaking old habits because you're competing with your friends and you're comfortable. But when you're out there practicing by yourself, you can just feel free to try different things. Nobody's judging you and you can get in the zone. 
Because when you're in the tournament, your buddy's not there to push you. It's just you in the course and you're standing out there by yourself. You need to feel that I can do it by myself and I can do what I want to do. That's how you develop your routines. That's how you get better at disc golf is you practice by yourself. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, real quick, three tips I'm going to give you guys to practice your putting stroke in general. First one is called finger spring. You heard of finger spring? When you let go of your putter, it is very important that you point your fingers. And they, see this motion right here? A lot of people are going like this. All right? But what you want to do is as you come up, you want to spring your fingertips. See how your hand will do that? You really want to do that when you putt. I can't do it in talk. But. So give that a try. Let me get out of the way. Really extend. Like Feel like you're bouncing your fingertips. Extend. Next thing, and I already said it twice, but I want to make sure you hear it. You must start your putt from a thumb at least at 10 o'clock. At least 10 o'clock. If you're in the same color, cough it up. There you go. So look, most people are putting 11 to 12 when they hold it out in front of them. You have to get it to at least 10. I like 9. I wish I could get to 9 sharp, but I'm just not comfortable. So about 9, 30, 10. That causes the rotation on itself. Then you won't have to spin the disc with your, your fingers at the end that can spring up. So number two is, always make sure your thumb starts between nine and 10. 